Hello there and welcome back to Construction Grammar and its application to English. In this video I'd like to talk about chapter 9 of the new second edition of Construction Grammar and its application to English. And in this chapter we'll be looking at spoken language. What is it that Construction Grammar can reveal about speech and about the structures that we find in spoken conversation? Now this topic hasn't received a whole lot of attention and so let's get to it and let's see what we can actually find. Um, I think there's no better way to start than uh, with an actual example of spontaneous conversation. And uh, this example here is taken from the Santa Barbara Corpus of Spoken American English. The speaker is named Lynn and she's talking about her experience working with horses. Uh, let's listen to this. I mean, you get so tired. You just... It takes, well, it takes me longer than most people because, you know, I'm not as strong and, and I'm not as good as, like, somebody that would do it all the time. All right. So I think we can agree that this is a natural specimen of human speech uh, taken from a spontaneous conversation between friends. So this is language as we know it. Right. Um, now, you're familiar with construction grammar. Um, the fact that you've clicked on this video tells me that you know a thing or two about uh, what construction grammar is all about. So I would actually, at this point, like you to engage in a thought experiment and just ask yourself, um, well, how a construction grammarian would approach this particular example here? Yeah. So what is it in this example that will be interesting from the perspective of construction grammar? Now, there obviously is no uh, single right or wrong answer here, but uh, research in construction grammar has focused on a couple of fairly well-defined areas. If you want to do this exercise, you can pause the video now and think a little bit about this example and uh, jot down a few notes about what strikes you as interesting. So I will continue now. Um, okay, so uh, constructional work, of course, often focuses on aspects of syntax. So phenomena like, for instance, the complement clause construction, I mean, and then you get so tired in the very first line. Uh, that is something that construction grammarians might be interested in. Also, uh, a bit further down in the example, we find it takes me longer than most people. And there um, we find a phenomenon that's interesting from uh, the perspective of verbal argument structure. Yeah, so argument structure following the uh, work of Adele Goldberg and others, that's a classic topic in construction grammar. So a construction grammarian might notice here that the verb take occurs in an interesting subcategorization frame so that we have a non-referential subject it. Uh, it takes me longer than most people. What does this it even refer to? Uh, we have a patient argument, me, and then we have a final argument that specifies a temporal duration. It, it takes me longer than most people. So um, this utterance then is similar to uh, utterances like it took them three years or I don't know how long it will take me. So that's an interesting ditransitive use of uh, the verb take. Then uh, construction grammarians are of course very fond of idiosyncratic patterns like the as as um, construction that we have here. So I'm not as strong and not as good as like somebody that would do it all the time. Okay, so if we let a construction grammarian loose on this example, it's probably safe to say that one or two of these phenomena or similar things would end up uh, being the focus of analysis. Okay, so now that we've done this little thought experiment, I would like us to do the opposite. Yeah, so what are aspects of this example that a construction grammarian perhaps would not focus on? So in other words, what are the blind spots in constructional research? So uh, again, you can stop this video and look at this example a bit more and ask yourself, uh, what are the phenomena that construction grammarians probably wouldn't be talking about? Yeah, okay, so um, I'm going to continue now. Um, Giving this example another look, uh, there are a few phenomena that seem to qualify for the things that construction grammarians might ignore or might not talk about. Okay, so um, hesitations and false starts, the thing that you see 
uh, in the second and third line, yeah? So Lin says, I mean, you get so tired and you just, it takes, so that kind of phenomenon. Um, that doesn't figure prominently in constructional research. So at least I'm not aware of any constructional account that would be specifically dedicated to uh, the analysis of false starts. If you know of stuff, you know, put it in the comments, let me know, I'd be very interested. Um, okay, also I don't think there are many studies on strings like cause you know, okay? Um, I will talk about stuff like cause you know uh, later in this video under the heading of what I'll be calling projections. So projection, that's a label uh, that is motivated by the fact that an important function of these elements, elements like cause you know, um, is to make the hearer anticipate a part of the utterance that is still to come, that is still upcoming. Okay, um, then we have of course the as-as construction and within that construction, uh, there's a phenomenon that also deserves to be uh, you know, closely looked at, namely the repetition of I'm not as. So I'm not as strong and and I'm not as good. Yes? And there's a certain amount of repetition, uh, recycling of words in there. And uh, this phenomenon has been called retraction. And also about this, construction grammarians at present have relatively little to say, except perhaps that speakers reproduce and simultaneously vary parts of a construction. Okay, so all of these phenomena, um, construction grammarians would probably say that, yeah, that's kind of interesting, but those are side issues. Those are not really the things that we're interested in. And that, of course, is a response that you would not only get from construction grammarians, but perhaps also from uh, linguists of other theoretical backgrounds. Okay, um, right. So what is this video about? Um, <clears throat> so one point that I want to make is that uh, spoken language remains something of a blind spot in construction grammar, even though there's interesting work uh, going on, and I'll be talking about some of this work in this video. Um, so, <clears throat> but once you reflect on it, uh, once you look and uh, critically reflect on the way construction grammarians do their analyses, uh, it becomes more or less obvious that construction grammar suffers from something that is known as the written language bias. Yeah? So the analytical categories that we use, the, tropi the topics that we give priority to, uh, those are inherently geared towards the analysis of language as a more or less static object, like words on a page. Okay, um, So it's, it's worth stopping for a minute and thinking what the implications would be if we were to observe the specific characteristics of spoken language, and if we were to take them seriously, not as a side issue, not as a kind of noise to be filtered out, but rather as the main object of study. Okay, right, uh, let me give a quick overview of uh, the rest of this talk. So I'll start by suggesting a few ways in which we can overcome the written language bias. I'll talk about what exactly I mean by that. Uh, and one important aspect of that will be the notion of online syntax that has been uh, developed by Peter Auer. Um, I will say a few words about uh, Paul Hopper's emergent grammar and the idea of emergent constructions. And to illustrate how all of these ideas relate to actual constructional analyses, I then want to talk about two construction types that are actually used in spoken language. So here I turn to WH clefts as a first example. Um, if you've watched the video on information packaging, uh, we'll come back to some of the issues that I discussed there, but we'll view them in a new light, okay? Um, okay. And that's the first example. And then the second example will be uh, what I call collaborative insubordination. Uh, that's a term that I made up. It hasn't really caught on. Um, it was in a paper that I wrote in German. And so, of course, nobody read it. But it's a fun um, phenomenon. And yeah, uh, so I want to talk about it. All right. So um, in the end, there will be some conclusions. Yeah. Right. Let's talk about the uh, written language bias and how we can overcome it. 
Yeah. So the problem, of course, with inherent biases is that uh, when you have them, they're kind of difficult to notice. Yeah. Uh, ask uh, any uh, philosopher out there. Yeah, that's what it is. So since it's always easier to see flaws in other people, uh, I would like to show you a quote uh, from Noam Chomsky <clears throat> uh, from Syntactic Structures, so the book that started it all for many. Um, and this quote reflects an idea that I think remains canonical in linguistics today, if you agree with Chomsky or not. Yeah? So this is kind of the bedrock of linguistic thought that um, informs a lot of linguistic research, no matter what your theoretical persuasion is. Okay, so let me read this to you. Um, from now on, I will consider a language to be a set, finite or infinite, of sentences, each finite in length and constructed out of a finite set of elements. Okay, so that's the famous, we have a limited number of words, we have a limited number of syntactic rules, and we can put these together and derive as many sentences as we like. Yeah? Take any book, uh, open it at a random page, put your finger down, and you'll find a sentence that you've never uh, seen before. Okay, good. Um, he goes on. The fundamental aim in the linguistic analysis of a language L is to separate the grammatical sequences, which are the sequences of L, from the ungrammatical sequences, which are not sentences of L, and to study the structure of the grammatical sequences. Yeah. So the job of the linguist is uh, to figure out whether or not you can say things like uh, himself, John saw in the mirror, and if you can't, why? Can't you do this? And if you can, then, uh, well, that is part of the grammar and that you know, is something that you should have an account for, why that works and why the other stuff doesn't work. Right, so obviously there's stuff in there that I actually agree with, yeah? but there are also several issues that merit our attention. So let's look at those. Um, <clears throat> so one, of course, is the focus on sentences first word that I marked up in red here. So sentences are presented as the basic units of interest. Knowing a language is knowing how to make sentences, not utterances. Yeah? So uh, that's already some kind of assumption that creeps in there. And um, then these sentences are constructed out of a finite set of elements, words, that belong to different parts of speech. So we have nouns and verbs and adjectives and prepositions and things like that. Yeah. And then um, the main aim of linguistics is to distinguish grammatical sentences from ungrammatical sentences. In other words, uh, which sentences get a little star at the beginning and uh, which sentences are fine. How do we explain why some sentences are bad and some sentences are good and so on and so forth? How do we construct at the end of the day a set of rules that generate all the good sentences and only the good sentences? Yeah, that's the that's the end game. That's what we want to do as linguists. Um, if we're like Chomsky, that is. Yeah. So what um, you might already appreciate uh, is how these ideas are kind of nudging us towards seeing language as basically written language. Yeah? So sentences are the kind of thing that you read on the page. Um, utterances are what you find when people actually talk. Okay, so um, sentences then are static and complete units. They have words as building blocks that instantiate pre-existing categories like nouns and verbs. They can be analyzed in terms of a fixed constituent structure. They can be assessed with regard to grammaticality. So himself, John saw in the mirror, is not a grammatical sentence of English. And, um, well, <laughs> my addition here, their natural habitat is the printed page, not the conversation. By contrast, um, utterances are produced in real time. Word classes, well, they exist, yeah, but um, if you think back to the third video in this uh, series about the Constructicon and how um, Bill Croft uh, has developed this idea that constructions are really um, generated bottom-up in a way. So uh, word classes 
come from utterances. You know, the utterances are basic, the word classes are derived, not the other way around. You know, that's quite fundamental. Um, constituent structure. You know, in sentences, we can be perfectly sure that, okay, this is the prepositional phrase, this is the verb phrase that it belongs to, and so on and so forth. In spoken language, constituent structure is a lot more messy, it's a lot more dynamic, and it's negotiable. I'll have examples of this uh, that will illustrate this point. Um, in utterances, there are these quote-unquote imperfections, like hesitation markers, or false starts, or um, other phenomena that are peculiar to the spoken domain, like people finishing each other's sentences. Um, there, I said sentence. Um, okay, so those phenomena can be shown to be functional rather than just noise. So what I said earlier about uh, spoken language having these phenomena that we would like to abstract away from because they are blocking our way to the real phenomena, well, that's actually the completely wrong approach. Yeah? So uh, we have to see the phenomena that are peculiar to spoken language as functional. We have to ask, what are they doing there? Why are speakers behaving in the way they do? And lastly, of course, utterances have their natural habitat, which is the spontaneous conversation. All right, so if you're still unsure whether or not you yourself are suffering from the written language bias, uh, you can do the following thought experiment. Yeah? So with regard to speech, we are very quick to call something a performance error, yeah? a little imperfection that is natural in speech. Now, can you imagine someone pointing to a phenomenon in writing and saying, you know, oh, well, this is a natural shortcoming of written language? Yeah? That's not something that is easily done. So somehow the natural characteristics of spoken language are seen as messy, and the natural characteristics of written language are seen more or less as the true reflection of what language actually is. So that, you know, <laughs> I'm guilty of that. Yeah, I admit that. Um, that is the, the written language bias. Okay, so um, <clears throat> Parallel, who you see here in, in this photo, um, he has pointed out that one central aspect of the written language bias is uh, a view of language that is metaphorical and uh, that portrays language as a static object. <clears throat> so this metaphorical view of language has been identified and studied by Michael Reddy, who you see here as well. And uh, Reddy called it the conduit metaphor. So that's one of the famous conceptual metaphors. Uh, I guess Lakoff has also talked about it at some point. Um, so the basic idea in this view is that uh, we have a mapping <clears throat> between uh, the target domain language and meanings and words and things like that, and then the source domain, which is, um, well, I guess, uh, shipping objects from A to B, yeah? Okay, so um, the parts of that metaphor are that meanings are objects, linguistic expressions are objects, uh, linguistic expressions have meanings in them, so there are little boxes with, you know, a meaning surprise in them, like an Amazon package that comes to your door. And uh, in communication, a speaker sends a fixed meaning to a hearer via the linguistic expression that's associated with that meaning. Yeah, so uh, meaning goes into the box through the conduit. Um, the listener gets the box, wonders what the hell might be in here, and they open it. And lo and behold, there's the meaning, and then they have understood what the speaker wanted to say. Yeah. Um, so the conduit metaphor is basically what lay people have in mind when they think about communication and how it works. Yeah? So words mean something, and you have to know the word and understand the word, and that's how it works. Now, um, even though you may know that things are not that simple, we still fall prey uh, to this idea in some aspects of our work. Okay, so what's to be done? <clears throat> Among other things, uh, one important measure is to put the focus squarely on temporal aspects of language. So noticing 
that language is something that happens dynamically through time, and to focus on uh, these temporal phenomena, and to recognize that these aspects are actually phenomena that should be the object of analysis rather than noise that we should filter out of it. Yeah. So three ideas that are especially important here and that merit our attention are um, what I will talk about as transitoriness, irreversibility, and synchronization. I'll talk about each of these in turn. Um, okay, so what's transitoriness? Um, the transitory nature of spoken language means that as soon as you have produced an utterance, it's almost gone already. Yeah, It doesn't linger. And uh, this has consequences because there are limits on the memory that speakers and hearers have. So the memory uh, resources that we have, that imposes restrictions on language use. And as a consequence, speakers will, for example, avoid structures that are too hard to process, that have too high uh, requirements with regard to working memory. Um, yeah, does that mean that spoken language is less complex than written language, at least in some aspects of it? Well, let's take another look at the example that we saw earlier here. Um, all right, so this is uh, Lynn, and she says, I mean, you get so tired, you just, it takes, well, it takes me longer than most people, because, you know, I'm not as strong and I'm not as good as, like, somebody that I, that would do it all the time. Um, now, the example militates against the idea that spoken, spontaneous conversation is not complex or mainly consists of simple sentences. So let's look a bit at what's going on here syntactically. Yeah, Let's check out the syntactic structure of this utterance a bit more closely. Um, so here I have um, a syntactic analysis which is not formalized by any stretch. Yeah, So this is not x-bar syntax or anything, but it tries to capture the syntactic dependencies in a very simple way. Okay, so let's maybe listen to this once more and you can read along and go along uh, with the parts of the utterances I've laid them out here. I mean, you get so tired. You just, it takes, well, it takes me longer than most people because, you know, I'm not as strong and, and I'm not as good as like somebody that would do it all the time. Okay, so structurally, we start with a coordination of two main clauses. Yeah? So we have, I mean, you get so tired, and you just, it takes, well, it takes me longer than most people. So um, the second of the two main clauses is then elaborated with a causal adverbial clause, you know, starting with cause, you know. Um, so, and that adverbial clause in itself contains a dependency structure with the as as construction and then the final noun phrase of uh, the as as construction actually has a relative clause inside it yeah somebody that would do it all the time so my point here is not only that there is quite a lot of complexity but also that the complexity is of a certain type so the main way in which complexity is built up here in speech is uh, through what we can call right branching. That is, we have an utterance, and then the speaker takes the final element of that utterance and adds something onto it. Yeah, that can be just uh, a coordinated uh, second sentence. It can be that the last element is modified with an adverbial clause, or the last element is modified with a relative clause, things like that. Okay, so and then we have uh, a second part, and then we can take the last part of that second part and modify it again and again and again. So this kind of complexity uh, leads to these chains of syntactic elaborations, uh, you know, one example of which you see on this slide. So the kind of complexity that we see in spoken language is thus mm, related more or less directly to the transitory nature of spoken language as such. Okay, um, so that's transitoriness. Let's move on to irreversibility. Um, so as <laughs> you may have experienced yourself, whatever is said is said. You can't take it back. Yeah? 
So you cannot erase something that has been said, but you can add new material. So that puts a constraint on how language works. Yeah. So um, a frequent phenomenon that I'm sure uh, you're familiar with to some extent is repair. So a speaker recognizing that something has gone wrong and trying to fix it. Yeah? In structural terms, what happens in repair is often backtracking to a trouble source, the point where it somehow went wrong, and starting afresh uh, from that point. So um, we actually can observe this in the uh, example that we looked at. So we have the initial part, I mean you get so tired, which is continued then with and you just. <clears throat> so that's the, the first try in a way. Uh, and Lynn is not happy with that try. So she starts over. It takes. That somehow doesn't work either. So uh, she puts in the hesitation marker well. And ultimately on the fourth try she goes, it takes me longer than most people. Okay, so these false starts document the online editing process that the speaker goes through and uh, they are not noise. Yeah? They are interpreted by the hearer in terms of, okay, she's thinking, she's working on it and uh, she's not happy with the first couple of drafts that uh, she has put out. Yeah? So it's not noise, it's information. <clears throat> Let's move on to uh, synchronization and to the idea that language production and language processing are tightly coordinated in a lockstep kind of process. So listeners process ongoing utterances incrementally uh, and they anticipate what it is that the speaker is going to say next. And uh, again, we have uh, good evidence that this is the case both from um, uh, psycholinguistic uh, experimental studies, but also uh, just from observational data. And uh, one important phenomenon in this regard is the co-construction of utterances, uh, speakers finishing each other's sentences. Here's an example. Uh, let's give it a listen and you can pay attention to the underlined parts here. It turns out as a spouse I get in free. Oh really? So, it's okay. a group class, yeah. Okay, so um, Harold produces the utterance, uh, I get in free, yeah? uh, and Jamie <clears throat> provides some additional information, namely to group classes, which somehow restricts the scope of uh, I get in free. Yeah? So, um, and this is kind of interesting because you see that there are actually utterances intervening between what Harold says and what Jamie says, but no one is confused about this. Yeah? So it's clear to the hearers and to you that Jamie's two group classes belongs syntactically and semantically to Harold's I get in free. <clears throat> All right, so the idea would be that we can take a step back from the written language bias by taking seriously the transitoriness, irreversibility, and synchronization of language and uh, that we understand these to be central parts of what it is that we want to analyze and not as noise or imperfections. But uh, taking these issues seriously means that we need to some extent a new vocabulary to talk about linguistic structures and that's where we'll go uh, next. So um, I would very much like to draw your attention to the framework of online syntax uh, that has been developed by Peter Auer, um, German linguist from Freiburg University. Uh, I've had the fortune of you know, uh, working alongside uh, Peter and Freiburg. Some of you are undoubtedly familiar with his work uh, and in his writings he tries to rethink syntax from a perspective that engages with the temporality of language. So again, we have three terms that are of central importance here, namely what our calls projection, expansion, and retraction. And again, I want to talk about each of these uh, in turn. Right, um, so let's start with projection. What is projection? Uh, projection is simply the process by which uh, linguistic elements create expectations within the hearer. We've already seen examples that illustrate this process. Um, so if we again look at Lynn's utterance here, 
we find projecting elements. Um, so there are projecting elements at the beginning that allow us as hearers to anticipate what kind of structures will follow in the upcoming discourse. So, for example, uh, a sequence like you just, yeah, uh, we have a subject pronoun and a little adverb there. Uh, so that leads us to anticipate an upcoming verb phrase of some sort. Yeah, it's a flag that you know, this utterance can't finish right there. There has to be something that is still coming up. And um, as a hearer, you know that. You know that Lin's utterance is not complete. You're waiting for something more, and you're actively constructing a syntactic representation of what that upcoming unit might be. So you're not just a passive uh, processing machine of whatever it is that Lin uh, shouts at you, but rather you have a much more active role. You're trying to anticipate, you're constructing the next possible steps of what Lin's utterance might be. Um, let's take another example. So clause linkers like um, cause or because uh, combined here with uh, you know, they project an upcoming clausal unit, what I called S here. So because um, you know, the next thing has to be a sentence. Yeah. So it makes sense to think of these elements not just as uh, syntactic placeholders in a structural pattern. Yeah. So satisfying the structural needs of, let's say, a grammatical rule that says uh, you need a complementizer or you need some kind of uh, coordinating conjunction or whatever. Uh, rather, it makes much more sense to interpret them as road signs that guide the listener's anticipation of upcoming material. So our argues that projection uh, is not only a basic fact of language, yeah, but also that projection has tangible benefits for both speaker and hearer. Yeah? So speakers can create anticipation in the hearer by using elements that project upcoming elements. And uh, hearers, they continuously monitor ongoing utterances and they anticipate what will come next. So the cognitive benefits for the hearer are that if the speaker uses elements that are strongly predictive of, of, of what follows, yeah, then this actually minimizes working memory effort. It's good for the hearer. And for the speaker, um, it kind of works the same way. Yeah? So a projecting element already determines the overall structure of the rest of the sentence. Uh, so I've said sentence again. Um, so all that's left to do really is the retrieval of lexical material. Okay. Um, now, there's also a practical benefit for the speaker. Um, if I have a projection um, triggering part uh, in my utterance, then hearers will actually wait for uh, the element that will complete that projection. So hearers will wait for a turn completion point. Right. <clears throat> um, let's actually listen to one example that uh, illustrates this. Um, <clears throat> this is from a lecture, so let's listen to this. If I make the statement, which I did, that there's no fear factor when it comes to the Chicano Latino community, and there is much more of a fear factor in dealing with the African American community, am I not dealing with a racial factor of power? Okay, so the crucial projecting element here is the very first line. Yeah? If I make the statement, which I did, um, so here the speaker produces what linguists call the uh, uh, protasis, the first part of a conditional clause, uh, which projects a closing part, the apodosis or the then clause. So in this example, you could say that the speaker actually artfully suspends the closing part. There are a bunch of intervening parts between the if clause and the then clause. Um, until finally then the projected element is added to the utterance. So that's projection. Yeah? Everybody's waiting for this final part. And I'm not trying to say that projection is a tool for producing artful rhetoric, although in this case it certainly is. Um, actually, we see projection in much more mundane contexts. Everybody does it, everybody knows how it works, and it benefits both speaker and hero.
There are two small things that I should add though. Yeah, uh, Projection varies in strength. It's not an either or type of phenomenon, but rather it is something that comes in degrees. It sits on a continuum. So some elements are very strong predictors of an upcoming structure. Yeah, if you think of the first part of an if clause that uh, makes you anticipate a then clause. Determiners are very strong predictors of a following nominal of some kind, so that you have an overall noun phrase. And an auxiliary and a pronoun uh, that <clears throat> makes you anticipate a verb phrase somewhere down the line. There are other elements that only weakly predict an upcoming structure. So for instance, if you have uh, the verb recommend, as in I recommend, yeah, I recommend can be followed by that clause, it can uh, be followed by an in clause, it can be followed by a noun phrase. So I, I recommend that you order the sushi, I recommend trying the sushi, I recommend the sushi, all of this is possible. And um, well, uh, the preferences of a given um, projecting element depend to some extent on you know what following structures are frequently used with that element. Okay, um, another point is that projection can actually be retroactive. This is something that Paul Hopper has discussed a little bit um, and that is also illustrated in this example here, the Lin, uh, I mean you get so tired example. So towards the end of this example Lin says I'm not as strong and uh, here, well, there's actually something going on. Yeah? So you note that this use of as strong does not predict a second as with 100% certainty. So the utterance could have played out in such a way that Lin simply would have said, you know, I'm not as strong and I just don't like it. Yeah? No second as. However, um, the following context shows that eventually there is a closing as so an as that corresponds to this first projecting uh, as, and that appears. Uh, but what we do not know, really, just looking at this example, is whether Lynn planned this all along, or whether she decided sort of retroactively, after the fact, to turn the first as into a projecting element. Yeah. Okay, that's projection. Let's move on to expansion, which is the process of elaborating on material that has already been produced. What do I mean, what do I mean by that? Uh, here's an example. It's again Lynn talking about horses, but this time a different passage. So let's listen to this. So, you know, like a lot of people that have a lot of horses and stuff, and that they're riding a lot, they just let the college kids do them for them, you know? Okay. <clears throat> um, so the part of Lin's utterance that is undergoing expansion here is the noun phrase a lot of people. <clears throat> uh, following a lot of people we have uh, a first expansion in the shape of a relative clause, uh, a lot of people that have a lot of horses and stuff, and then uh, this uh, relative clause contains another noun phrase, a lot of horses and stuff, and this noun phrase is being expanded in a second expansion, that they're writing a lot. Yeah. Um, so this kind of illustrates the, the right branching and chaining uh, phenomenon that I talked about earlier. So we see this also in Lynn's earlier examples. Chains of noun phrases and relative clauses that's a typical pattern uh, of you know, how speakers can introduce an idea and then they uh, present some additional info about that idea. They introduce new ideas in the process and the process just repeats and repeats and repeats as needed. Yeah? Um, expansion. <clears throat> expansion don't just happen in the nominal domain, yeah? so noun phrases, relative clauses, um, and so on and so forth, but uh, we actually see a second example in this um, uh, utterance here where Lynn says um, <clears throat> uh, they'll just let the college kids do them. So this final do them, uh, that's a 
verb phrase, uh, is expanded with the prepositional phrase forum, you know. Yeah. So again, we do not know if Lynn planned this all along or if this is just something that she did uh, on a whim uh, because she wasn't satisfied with the uh, end of, you know, let the college kids do them. <clears throat> okay, moving on to our third notion, uh, expansions. Um, wait a second. No, no, no. I just want to uh, wrap this up with expansions. So expansions are elaborations of existing parts of an utterance. They're not projected by the existing utterance, but rather, um, yeah, um, pr produced on the go. They're not necessarily creating projections of their own. Sometimes they do. Uh, and they serve to flesh out uh, and provide new information about an utterance that a speaker has made. Right, so now I want to move on to the third notion of uh, retraction, which is um, taking something back that you've said. Now, of course, you cannot literally take something back that you've said or make it unsaid. So retraction, you could say, is the art of adding something so whatever you've said before appears in a slightly different light. Here's how Lynn does it. Let me show you. Um, so in the example that you know very well by now, she uh, starts a sentence. I mean, you get so tired and you just... <clears throat> uh, she starts over. Yeah, it takes... She produces a hesitation marker. Well, and then she finally comes up with a definitive version of the second part. It takes me longer than most people. And um, that kind of going back, starting over process, that is retraction. Retraction is thus involved in uh, repair, yeah? but it is not only happening in repair. So sometimes retraction um, is not used to uh, correct something or to replace something, but it's rather used to elaborate or to add nuance similar to uh, what we've seen in expansion. So if you consider uh, the last couple of lines here, I'm not as strong and I'm not as good as like somebody that would do it all the time. Um, so what happens here is that Lynn starts over from a given syntactic position. So um, I'm not as strong, that's where it starts. And then I'm not as good. That is not a correction or a replacement of I'm not as strong. It just adds. It presents an alternative to I'm not as strong. So it adds a part to this utterance. All right, so just to sum this up, um, retractions <clears throat> mean that you're trying to take back something that you have said, even though you cannot literally do that. However, you can add new material with the intention of replacing or reactivating, that's also a useful notion, uh, earlier material. We often find this in self-repair. Um, and in reactivation, we find it as a paraphrase of earlier material that, that adds nuance and richness. Okay, so to put this all together, um, ours model <clears throat> with projection, expansion, and retraction um, gives us a vocabulary that allows us to come to terms with syntax as it unfolds over time. So that is a move away from discarding speech-specific phenomena as just noise, but rather it invites us to see uh, these phenomena as the, the proper object of analysis. Okay, um, you may listen to this and think, yeah, I agree, but how do we apply all of this to the notion of constructions and construction grammar. Well, I'm so glad you asked. Yeah, um, I would like to argue that applying these concepts to constructional analyses amounts to an important shift in perspective uh, because it allows us to think of language uh, as an emergent phenomenon and of syntactic patterns as emergent constructions. And that's what we'll turn to now. So the term emergent constructions and emergent grammar goes back to Paul Hopper and his classic 1987 paper, Berkeley Linguistic Society on Emergent Grammar. If you haven't read it, go and read it. Uh, it's as fresh as uh, in 87 and you find something new in it every time. So Paul, if you're watching this, uh, well, he's one of my all-time heroes, really. 
Okay, so here's a quote that I want to read to you uh, <clears throat> because it just stays fresh and, and relevant and important. So here it goes. Uh, the notion of emergent grammar is meant to suggest that structure or regularity comes out of discourse and is shaped by discourse as much as it shapes discourse in an ongoing process. Grammar is hence not to be understood as a prerequisite for discourse, a prior possession attributable to an identical form to both speaker and hearer. So this is kind of... Uh, <laughs> Hopper is lashing out a bit at the uh, Chomsky quote that I read to you earlier. Now, let's unpack this a little bit. What does Hopper actually mean? There are two main ideas that we can take away from the quote. Uh, the first is that grammar is shaped by discourse. So the temporality of linguistic interaction that we've been looking at, that has a direct effect on the structures that appear in speech. Yeah? So language in its transitoriness, its irreversibility, and its synchronization imposes certain constraints or, or introduces certain biases that shape how grammar actually looks like. Okay, uh, you might go along with that and say, yeah, you know, that's kind of functionalist 101. That's, that's what we do. Yeah, that's basic. Um, so let's go to idea two which is slightly more controversial. Yeah? So here Hopper says that grammar is not a prerequisite for discourse. So grammar cannot be defined as a set of schemas that uh, pre-exists language use. And important aspects of language use come about as emergent phenomena. So an emergent phenomenon is like uh, the, the fact that in any given supermarket that you uh, shop in, the lines at the checkout are of approximately the same length. So there is no rule that says that it has to be this way. Uh, it's not orchestrated. You know, people don't put up signs, you know, please get in line so that the uh, that there are about equal numbers of customers at each line. You don't have to do this. Uh, rather, it just emerges from the fact that every individual shopper is looking for the shortest line and takes that one. Yeah? So, what Hopper tells us is just as we don't need to posit a supermarket organizer who makes sure that the lines are equally long, we actually don't need to posit certain cognitive representations of syntactic structures that ensure that speakers talk grammatically. Okay, let me give an example. Um, so here again, you see Lynn's utterance along with the syntactic analysis into a coordination construction, an adverbial clause, the as-as construction, and then the final relative clause. So when we analyze the structure syntactically, we actually have a choice. Yeah. So do we analyze the structure as if it were planned in advance so that all the speaker does is really just realizing a schema that pre-exists the utterance? Or what we rather say that this structure is created incrementally, bit by bit, as the speaker goes along and kind of adds a little bit here and a little bit there. Yeah, always uh, referring back to the last thing that was said and elaborating that, expanding that a little bit. So this second view, the incremental creation of utterances like this, that seems much more realistic, but the traditional view from construction grammar would actually invite us to see things the other way, right? Okay, so as you're all aware, um, construction grammar views knowledge of language as an inventory of four meaning pairings that speakers draw on when they use language. So um, <clears throat> this actually creates a bias. Yeah? So any patterns that we see in discourse, we are inclined to view as reflections of existing schemas, of these constructions. And when we, when we see something in spoken corpus data, we go, oh, I think I found a construction. I think I found a generalization that exists in speakers' minds. Yeah? And what Hopper gives us here is an important corrective or an important slap on the wrist. Um, so what Hopper says is that, look, for many structures that you see in discourse, you don't need to posit anything cognitive. Yeah? Many patterns in discourse are really just emergent phenomena. And I shouldn't say just, 
emergent phenomena. But uh, that, you know, again, that's my uh, written language bias coming through. Uh, so I um, automatically talk down anything that is specific to speech and not in line with my, well, beliefs as a construction grammarian that are near and dear to my heart. Okay, so that's important, yeah? But the question that is raised by this, and that is by no means trivial, is how do we decide between the patterns in discourse that actually are constructions, cognitive generalizations, and which patterns in discourse are just emergent? How do we identify emergent constructions? <clears throat> so, um, let me first give you a definition of what uh, emergent constructions are. Uh, emergent constructions, for the purpose of this video and also the chapter in the book, I define as patterns in discourse that do not reflect uh, cognitive schemas that exist in your knowledge of language. Now, um, these patterns come about as a result of two forces. Namely, um, we have the temporality of language use, which gives rise to projection, expansion, and retraction. And then we have the interpersonal quality of language use, which gives rise to uh, audience design and co-construction. So I construct my uh, speech in such a way as to adapt and accommodate to uh, who my, my audience is and what they can do cognitively. And co-construction, well, I'll, I'll get to that uh, eventually. Okay, um, so <clears throat> knowledge of language is knowledge of construction, but, but something that we really shouldn't forget is that language use uh, shows us not just what speakers know, but it also shows us uh, patterns that we should uh, analyze as emergent phenomena. Um, one important addendum, and one thing that, again, so Hopper gives us an important corrective, and then I think there's a second important corrective to Hopper, namely uh, Joan Bybee and her work, uh, which tells us that over time, emergent constructions can actually undergo sedimentation. That is, if we hear them often enough, well, then they may actually become cognitively represented after all. Yeah? So frequent use leads to entrenchment, entrenchment leads to schema formation, and voila, we have a construction in the old-fashioned uh, construction grammar sense. Well, does this mean that uh, we don't need to worry about Hopper? I don't think so. Yeah? Right. Um, now, I'm coming to the final part of this video in which I want to illustrate these ideas with two construction types. Um, so let's start with uh, WH clefts and um, let's go to collaborative insubordination after that. Um, okay, let's go. So WH clefts, if you've been following this video series, you're familiar with them. Uh, they're basically combinations of a relative clause and a predicative construction. So what I need is a gin and tonic. What's interesting about clefts is their pragmatics. Um, so you can use them only in certain pragmatic contexts. And if the context is wrong, uh, the whole construction doesn't work. Yeah? So I talked about this in the video on information packaging constructions. Uh, if you haven't watched that, uh, go and watch it. And, and some of the things that I say here will become a little clearer. All right, let's look at an example. Uh, so this one you may or may not have seen. Yeah? So it's a fictional dialogue. You pick up the phone, you say hello, and your mother is on the line and says, it's your mother. What John lost was his wallet. And uh, you'd be really excused for feeling some confusion or even worry about your mother because a WH cleft is not the kind of thing that ordinary people use to open an ordinary conversation. Yeah? So there's something weird going on here because uh, starting a conversation with a WH cleft is in conflict with the pragmatic characteristics of that construction. So if you think about a sentence such as what John lost was his wallet, um, you can ask yourself in what communicative situations would this sentence be uttered and the answers that people give over and over again. So I'm doing this with my students uh, every semester, and they tell me, well, 
the interlocutors, they have already talked about John. They know who John is. Uh, they already talked about the fact that John has lost something. And there is a contrast between the lost thing that was talked about and the thing that was actually lost. Yeah? So there are these three characteristics that uh, give you the constraints on the pragmatic situations in which you can successfully use a WH cleft. <clears throat> okay, um, now, <clears throat> um, this can be observed also in corpus data. So here we have two examples of authentic WH clefts from written data. Um, so the first example, even, due, even during the darkest years, Churchill never entirely lost the affection of his countrymen. What he lost was their confidence. <clears throat> um, or when Charlie states that he lost money during the crash, but everything during the boom, he realizes that what he lost was his family and that they are important. So again, um, we see the three criteria at work here, showing us that WH clefts tie in with information that was presented before. Okay, um, so in construction grammar, uh, these kinds of constructions are described as um, constructions that are sensitive to um, <clears throat> the structure of the communicative situation. So what has been said before, what has not been said before, what the hearer can be expected to know already. And uh, when speakers use an information packaging construction, they can make an educated guess as to what it is that the speaker already knows. Okay, so this really just as a quick background discussion of WH clefts. Uh, the story changes a bit when we look at WH clefts in the spoken modality. Yeah, so up to now, I've, I've given you a fictional example and two written examples. Now let's look at what happens um, here. So let's listen to this. Well, you ought to do them. Cook all the fish, because we'll, we won't use it if you don't cook it. Well, I'm just going to make ceviche with the leftovers. Okay. <clears throat> so. Uh, the example starts with the relative clause part of the WH cleft. What you ought to do though, Mar. Yeah? And uh, then there is a back channeling uh, from Marilyn. She says, hmm. And then uh, Roy goes on to produce what looks like an imperative construction. Cook all the fish. <clears throat> so there is no copula. It's not what you ought to do though, Mar, is cook all the fish. <clears throat> so uh, you might worry a little bit, okay, is this a WH cleft uh, to begin with or is this something else? Well, functionally it is. Yeah? The imperative ties in with the previously uh, brought up topic of the fish and the question of you know, how much of it should be cooked. Uh, so in that sense, it's not that far away from the written examples. Uh, what's different though, is the structure. So we have this focus phrase without a copula, and then there are several expansions that still belong to the overall utterance. Uh, so Roy says, cook all the fish, cause, well, we won't use it if you don't cook it now. Yeah. So <clears throat> in speech then, uh, WH clefts are less tightly integrated syntactically and uh, their information structure really bleeds into subsequent syntactic structures. Um, yeah, so it's, it's not really a sentence level construction, but it always has the structure of a projector in the beginning. Um, not really a, a linking copula or anything, but rather then the speaker goes on and uh, tells this entire story or makes this longer point with lots of elaborations like Roy does here. Now, this is not an isolated case. <clears throat> Here we have uh, Lynn again, producing a structure that actually looks very similar. Let's listen to this. What you have to do... The uh, horseshoe is made, custom made for the horseman? No, no. No, what, what we do, then that's, that's where the farrier comes in. Every shoe is like, you order, you know, I would like a case of double lot shoes. You'd, the farrier gets them, you know, that's the way it goes. And then, our job is to shape the shoe to the horse's foot. Okay, so uh, here Lynn produces the first part of a WH cleft, uh, what we do. 
And again, the second part is not a canonical predicative construction. Like, okay, what we do is we put the stuff on the horse's feet. No, uh, what happens is an entire narrative that ends only a couple of clauses later. Yeah, so what we do, oh yeah, that's where the farrier comes in. A farrier, in case you didn't know, that's the guy who, who works with uh, horses and um, horseshoes and things like that. So the entire story goes, that's where the farrier comes in. Every shoe is like, you know, I would like a case of double odd shoes. You get, the farrier gets them. That's the way it goes. And then our job is to shape the shoe to the horse's foot. And that's where it ends. Okay, so I've been only meaning to give you a taste of uh, WH Clef, so let me summarize. Um, in spoken language, there are really more than a sentence level construction. Uh, the WH phrase is a projection. The projected element, the stuff that follows, needn't have a copula. It needn't consist of just one predicate, but rather the projection can be filled by multi-sentence uh, sequences. So it can be an entire narrative. And uh, this again illustrates that WH clefts in speech are adapted to the temporality of language use. Okay, I really want to go uh, to the final topic of this video, collaborative insubordination. Um, I like that term because it sounds so subversive and unruly. Uh, but what do I mean by that? Um, let's listen to this conversation here. I'm thinking one thing my mother always used to say when I wouldn't go bicycling with my friend. She, she would say, you'll be sorry when we're dead. Because you went bicycling? <laughs> because I wouldn't go bicycling with my father. Yeah. Okay, that's, that's very philosophical here. Um, now, the phenomenon that I'm interested in is the sequence that begins with Pamela saying, uh, you'll be sorry when we're dead. Yeah, And then Daryl adds, uh, because you wouldn't go bicycling with a kind of question intonation. And um, what's interesting here is that the two utterance actually form a syntactic whole, uh, where Pamela's part is the main clause, you'll be sorry when we're dead, and then Daryl adds a subordinate adverbial clause with because, you'll be sorry when we're dead because you wouldn't go bicycling with us. Now, this looks like co-construction, yeah? someone finishing someone else's sentence, but it is something else. So Daryl is not anticipating material that uh, maybe Pamela would have wanted to say, but rather he's giving an incredulous response to what Pamela just told him. Yeah? So syntactically, the adverbial clause is subordinate to Pamela's main clause, but pragmatically, it's doing something completely different. It's independent. And um, you can see this, for example, in the question intonation, that pragmatically, uh, Daryl is doing his own thing here. Okay, so collaborative insubordination, I view as the collaborative production of a hierarchical syntactic structure in which a speaker produces uh, what could be called an anchor, which is then elaborated by another speaker through a formally subordinate but uh, functionally and pragmatically independent continuation. <clears throat> so this continuation is not projected by the anchor. It's an expansion in uh, the way our uses this term. And the continuation is not produced as a suggestion of how the initial speaker may or may not have continued, but rather it has a pragmatic force that is independent of the utterance of the initial speaker. <clears throat> so what interests me with regard to collaborative insubordination is the question of uh, whether this phenomenon is to be seen as a construction or if we have here uh, rather something that we could study as an emergent phenomenon in the sense of Hopper. Yeah? So um, the question then is, have speakers formed a schema that they can draw on when they produce a collaborative insubordination? and um, have maybe similar instances of collaborative insubordination triggered a process of sedimentation so that maybe at first it was an emergent phenomenon but now it's actually um, yeah, uh, a sedimented construction that 
is mentally represented. And there is suggestive evidence for the second view because collaborative insubordination is not unconstrained. You cannot just put any two pieces of language together in this way. So here, uh, this is a fictional example. I apologize for that. Um, so speaker A says, do you know if this is the way to the main station? And speaker B replies, which is down the road on the left? So I don't know about you, but I find this slightly strange. Um, now, theoretically, this should be fine. Yeah? Speaker A produces an utterance that ends with a noun phrase, the main station, and speaker B does then give the answer to the question uh, with a collaborative insubordination, so uh, attaching the answer kind of to the noun phrase of speaker A with a relative clause that is then pragmatically doing something new. Uh, sounds good on paper, doesn't work in practice. Why? Yeah. <clears throat> so um, there's also evidence that sort of detracts from the constructional hypothesis uh, because um, <clears throat> collaborative insubordination occurs across a rather wide range of formal contexts, which makes it unlikely that speakers actually generalize across all of those contexts. Okay, uh, this has been a long video, so I'm coming to a close here. Um, now, <clears throat> construction grammar, I hope you have come to appreciate, is not free from uh, the written language bias. And uh, the natural temporality of spoken language really needs to be integrated more strongly into constructional accounts. I've mentioned uh, notions that can help us with this. So ours, uh, ideas of projection, speakers create expectations and then hearers anticipate or expansion, speakers elaborate on something that they have recently produced and this affects the kind of syntactic structures that we see, or retraction, um, speakers repair or reactivate produced utterances. All of that gives us well, or I should say, it puts us more in touch with the temporality of language. Um, we also need to be sensitive to the idea that constructions can be emergent. So not everything that you see in uh, spoken corpus data can be immediately uh, seen as a construction, but rather we should allow for the possibility that what we're seeing is actually an emergent phenomenon. So patterns in discourse needn't reflect underlying schemata, they can actually reflect the use of language in real time. All right, and with that, I'd like to come to a close. Um, if you have questions, you know, put them in the comments and I'll try my best to answer them. Um, if you have questions about the book, uh, do the same thing. Um, all right, that's it, and I hope to see you soon. Bye.